to follow along, correct? So, um, I'm the director of public projects at the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. You might not have had any idea that we were there. Um, but we've been around since 1994. And we were founded by a great public historian by the name of Roy Rosenzweig. For anyone who has done any uh, labor history, you might know Roy. He wrote a groundbreaking book called Eight Hours from What We Will. Uh, but from 1994 on, his concern was trying to think about the ways in which digital tools can help historians, whether professional or, or interested members of the general public, how digital tools can help historians do the work that they do. Um, when he started on this venture, we were in the age of CD-ROMs, basically. And so the very early work at the center uh, produced a book called Who Built America, which was one of the very first sort of social history textbooks of uh, American history. And it then went on to be a website. And we have moved sort of out of, out of the age of CD-ROMs into websites. Um, since then, we've done work We've gone from being a single individual and with a web server in a closet in a department uh, to being an organization that has a senior staff of five, about 13 historians with PhDs, and a general staff of about 45 more. Um, so it's a pretty big group, uh, and we're fully funded by grants. We get almost no support from the universities, so as you all turn to the National Endowment for the Humanities, so do we, <laughs> uh, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and, and private funders, and things like that. Um, so I'm only going to show you a few things today that, that may begin to help you um, think about doing work in the digital age. And one of them is uh, a book by founder Roy. Roy. Uh, and Dan Cohen, who is our current director, Roy passed away in 2007 from cancer, but he was, um, his place was taken by Dan Cohen, who was one of his, most, his closest collaborators. Uh, and this is a book called Digital History, A Guide to Gathering, Preserving, and Presenting the Past on the Web. And this really is, and it's only totally open access, and it's available to you for free on the website, which is chnm.gmu.edu. Uh, I know CHNM is like the world's worst acronym. It means nothing. I mean, it means something, but you will never remember it. Um, but hopefully I'll say it enough times tonight that, that you'll, it'll stick in your head. Um, but the idea in this book was not that it was going to be a uh, sort of theoretical meditation on what it means to do digital history. What it really is is a practical guide. And so if you have no experience with working, with producing your own history, in the digital realm, this is a perfect place to start. It explains an awful lot about um, how the web is set up, the kinds of historical resources that are available to you on the web so far, and what kinds of things you may want to think about as you design a digital history project. Um, it talks about how you might want to think about building an audience, what kinds of outreach you might want to do, um, how you may use the web, to collect history online for, from your constituents and from people in your community, and how to make history a more democratic process. And that, that is the, uh, that's the mission statement of the center, is to democratize history, both through creating projects that are free and open source, available to anyone, and to engaging people from all walks of life and all interests in thinking about history, but also in producing history, in producing their own history, preserving their own history. So digital history, great place to start. As I said, it's totally free. If you want a hard copy of it, you want to read a book instead of read it on the web, um, it's uh, available from Temple. I believe Temple is the press. Uh, but it's free to you here, and you can use it as you like. When we moved out of the era of CD-ROMs. We moved into two sort of very different elements uh, in our work. And that is we, we launched sort of divisions. Our very early work was in um, creating resources for teaching and learning history. So targeted primarily at the K-12 audience, but also at early college audiences, presenting uh, primary sources online and teaching students and teachers how to work with those primary sources in the ways that historians would. Um, but we then sort of moved into a realm, well, two realms, the realm of 
doing digital history research using digital tools and thinking more concretely about what it means to do public history online. Uh, and those two interests have actually come together in a free and open source tool that I hope will be of interest to all of you. I feel very strange with all of you people standing behind me. I'm sorry. But I'm going to flip this way for a little bit. I can walk around a little bit. That'll help. Uh, if I can stand back here, then you won't all be looking at my back. Uh, so, Omeka. Nobody can figure out how to say Omeka. I don't know why no one can figure out how to say Omeka, but that's, that's how we say it. Um, frequently confused with Omeka Okafor. That's, it's Emeka Okafor, but Omeka is the software. Um, Omeka is a Swahili word, word that means to present or unfurl. And our idea with Omeka was that we had been working for many years uh, with a variety of cultural heritage organizations, uh, partnering on a lot of collaborative projects with libraries, museums, and archives, sometimes with the Smithsonian, sometimes with the New York Public Library, um, sometimes with the Newberry Library in Chicago. And what we figured out was that we kept building the same website over and over and over again for them. And it's because they're cultural heritage organizations. What they want to do, or at least what they should want to do, is create an archive of their material and present it to the world. And then allow their content experts to share that expertise about those items. So they want to present their collections and share their content expertise about those collections. And so what we found was it would be better for everyone if we built a software that let other people have to have the ability to do that without having to have any programming skills. And so Omeka is that software. <laughs> uh, so Omeka in its first iteration, which is what you're looking at here, the site for, for, the, for the down, what we call the downloadable software, uh, is available to you if you have a server that you can run it on. Um, if you happen to have hosting at some place like DreamHost, they'll install it for you. Um, it's called one-click installation. Um, but it's a fairly simple process if you've ever installed a blog software. That's not true with most of the world. Most people have not installed server packages on, on, on servers. Uh, but this was the original software, and it created a framework for something called Omeka.net, which I'll show you later. Um, but one of the things about that we think is so neat about Omeka is that like lots of, of popular blogging software, it allows you as a user to change the look and feel of the site by changing the theme. So if anybody has signed up for a blogger blog or a wordpress.com blog or anything like that, you realize that you have lots of different looks and feels to ch choose from and you can turn them on and off. Well, this is exactly how Omeka works too. Um, so Omeka comes with a set of sort of fairly elementary themes. Um, but anybody who could build and design a theme for a WordPress site could build and design a theme for an Omeka site. And so the site that you're looking at here um, is Lincoln at 200 from the Newberry Library that looks very different than, let's say, uh, the Memorial Stadium site which was uh, designed by the University of Minnesota's library to ask members of their alumni association to contribute their memories of Memorial Stadium. Totally different looking site, same software. So, Omeka has a number of features. Not unlike popular blogging software, we wanted to allow users to decide what they wanted to be able to do with their stuff. And so, the basic core of Omeka is not very complicated, and it doesn't do a lot. Basically, what it, it allows you to do is build an archive out of items, and then build exhibits out of those items. But, through plugins, which are basically additional s software packages, it's possible to do a whole lot of other stuff. Um, some of it's very geeky. Most people don't know what an ad of output is, and don't care. I'm one of those people. Um, I mean, I sort of know what it is. I know what it's for. Um, barcodes and reports. If you want to print out what you've got in your archive, you might want that. Coins mix your archive Zotero readable. I'll talk about Zotero in a second. Uh, comments. Wouldn't it be nice for people to be able to comment on the material in your website? That's fairly useful. The contribution plugin. Hands down, this is the best thing for public 
for public historians that is available through Omeka, the contribution plugin. It opens up a form so that any of your users anywhere in the world can tell a story, they can add a picture, they can upload a sound file, um, you capture some metadata from them, it comes into your system, you as the project historian get to decide whether or not to publish it. So, it's not a freely open door, it allows you to decide whether you want to enhance the information about that item or not. Um, Creative Commons chooser, we like things to be free and accessible, so we'd like you to put Creative Commons licensing on your stuff so that other people can use it and share it. Uh, CSV import, if you've got a pile of stuff already, much easier to put it into the archive with an import plugin. Uh, the docs viewer will allow you to view uh, PDFs or Word docs on the site without people having to download them. So it's a nice little doc viewer window. I have no idea what the download logger is. Um, <laughs> every day there's a new one. Uh, Dublin Core Extended, not so. EAD will matter to the librarians in the room. The exhibit builder comes packaged comes packaged with the core software. Uh, and this was our sense that this was an, a totally important part of this feature is that lots of museums, libraries, and archives wanted to put their holdings online and just list them as a catalog. But we know that that's not where history is. There's all that stuff, but you as the historian need to tell the story around the stuff. And so the exhibit builder allows you to do that. It comes with 12 basic layouts, and you just drag and drop items from the archive into their spots on the page, and then you can add narrative material to that. The other thing that people love to combine with the contribution plugin is the geolocation plugin. So anything that someone could add, weird standing in front of you, um, anything that anyone would want to add to the site, they can also locate on a map, on a Google map. Um, you can do that with your own items in the site, but your users can do it too. Um, Google Translate works as well as Google Translate does, but if you've got multilingual audiences who may want to view your material in lots of different languages, it's possible for them to do a basic translation. Um, and there are a handful of other plugins that are useful and interesting. Image annotation, more commenting. Um, Library of Congress subject headings, we all know that nobody can remember those, so we plug them in automatically, if you'd like. Um, Doop, 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 doop. All right, let's move on. So let me show you a couple of sites that have been built with Omeka. Um, that use some of these features. One of the basic ones is the uh, Hurricane Digital Memory Bank. Uh, when the hurricane swept through New Orleans and, and those sort of Gulf states in 2005, we had a grant from the Sloan, Sloan Foundation. We were working on a bunch of other projects. But they realized that we had the capacity to collect the history of this tragedy through the web. And so they asked us to create, to create and publicize this site. And we built a really nice archive of people's memories of that tragedy, their experiences with it. Um, their course as they escaped the path of the hurricane. Um, if we look at the form here, it's a very, very simple form process that allows you to decide whether you're going to add a story, which you would just type in, or you would add another type of file. A form opens up, it allows you to add the file, describe the file, and then add some metadata about it. And then when you're done, down at the bottom, you can locate it on the map, either with an address, which will put the pin on there, or you can just click on the map. Uh, and then you can tell us a little bit about yourself as a contributor. And so you can see that lots of this information is optional. Um, one thing that we learned in doing these kinds of projects is you ask too many questions, people won't fill out your form. <laughs> so we try to ask really targeted questions, um, and then allow them the opportunity to add more information. So if we take a look at the browse, you'll see that we have a lot of stories, we have images, we have a whole bunch of other files, and then if you take a look at the map, come on, take a minute for the pins to load, you can look at particular items 
we could blow this up so, so it wasn't quite so crowded. Um, but you get this little browse of items that are located on the map. Um, and we have lots of partners in this project, uh, including the Smithsonian and a bunch of National Guard units and things like that. Um, but it is possible for any of you to use this software to do a similar kind of project in your own neighborhood. Um, let me see. We go one more. We do it on time. Um, so the way that you can do this, if you have no experience with servers and software, is something called Omega.net. And Omega.net is a service, a hosted service, where basically you can just go sign up for an account for an Omega site. Um, and if we take a look at the sign up, we've got a bunch of different packages. Uh, you can sign up for a single site for free just, just to try it out. You get five megabytes of storage, one site, five plugins, the numbers of which, the specificity of which I can never remember, um, and four themes. But that's, that's your chance to just sign up, play with it. You get an account. Um, but the basic, the plus plan, provides you with the exhibit builder, social bookmarking, the contribution plugin, a simple contact form, and the CSV import. So for $50 a year, you could set up a very attractive looking site that would allow you to engage your neighborhood in contributing their stories. Um, and if I take you to the showcase here, I can show you a couple of projects uh, that people are making out in the world that might be um, similar to the kinds of things that you might be interested in. Um, I don't know anything about Deseronto, Ontario, but they were one of our very first Omega.net users. Um, they chose what I think is probably not the most attractive theme, but they're just in the process of building their site, um, which is a local history of Deseronto. Um, but you see you can click on the contribute an item, select whether you want to contribute a story or an image, the form pops up, and into the site you can deposit your material. And so if we go over to browse the items, we can see that they only have 46 so far, uh, but they're getting there. We've got an interview, we've got some images. Um, and all of these, you see this one's in the first person. This is a story contributed by William Burkett. Um, and it's a pretty good size chunk of text um, that might be really fairly interesting. It doesn't have any files attached to it, but you can imagine somebody coming to tell their story and uploading some family pictures. Um, or, or small bits of family video, all sorts of, all sorts of good things. Um, maybe going back is just the best way to do this. Um, another one that might be interesting, you can say, is uh, the Eastern Oklahoma Tuberculosis Sanatorium. Um, the lady who's working on this project is just an interested person in the field who I believe her um, I believe her grandmother had something to do with this tuberculosis sanatorium. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the nicer things that are available to folks in Omega.net. And she's building a nice archive. Um, we've got a good about page that'll tell us a little bit about the site. Um, it's, it was her mother, I'm sorry. Um, but we've got a little introduction. There's, again, a contribution. Form. You can see it again in this page, it's very similar. Story and or document, down it goes. Uh, you can see that she has added some instructions to the form, um, which is possible. You can add, add some guiding instructions to folks so that they have, have a sense of um, what you'd like them to add. Um, but there, she has gathered, so far, almost 60 items <laughs> from the community. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's one of the possibilities. Another sort of piece of software that I can show you, um, which I'm going to hope that uh, I'm not going to prey on Jasper and, and show the Zotero collection, which is available to me from the bottom of the browser here. Yeah, I hope you can. <laughs> 
I do this with my own all the time. This is another one of our tools. It's called Zotero. Yes, we like these funny words. Um, this one, I believe, is Albanian, maybe? I think it's, I think it's Albanian. Um, and now I don't remember what it means. But this is started out as a way to conduct research in the browser. Um, we know that most of us do our secondary research using library websites, using Amazon.com, using the Library of Congress, using the DC Public Library site. Um, what this is is a plugin for your Zotero or for your Firefox browser. How many of you use Firefox as your web browser? I would wish more than anything to see every hand raised at some at some point. One reason to go to Firefox, it's a little bit slow. It's much less prone to viruses and invasion than IE. <laughs> so Chrome is good too, uh, but but Firefox is just safer. <laughs> so it's also free. It's from the Mozilla Foundation. So anyway, Zotero works as a plugin. Let's see. I am not positive you can totally see this down here, right on the very edge. See where my little mouse is there, right on the edge of the. <coughs> if I can lift this up. See, so Tara, the button. Um, when you have this plugin, I'll put this up and then down. Um, when you have this plugin, you get this little up and down window that allows you to go to Amazon.com or any sort of popular library site. And I'm going to do this, Jasper. Forgive me. Sir. Yeah. It's just so much more fun to do it than to show the video. So here we are at Amazon. And we'll do um, digital history. Let's see if we can get the book. Here it is. Here's the book. You'll notice, once this fully loads, there's a little book up in the browser. See where my mouse is? OK. Um, we click, and it drops it into your database. And then from there, control click, or maybe alternate click. What you can do with it is you can create bibliographic entries from it and those sorts of things. Um, so Terra Standalone allows you to organize your own material, but you can sync Zotero to the cloud so that your stuff can be available from anywhere. Uh, and you and your collaborators can form groups using Sync Zotero so that all of you can build collections together and share your materials. So, two and a half tools for you to think about as you go forward. Thank you. I'm going to cure this standing at the back of the room behind people and answer some questions if we have them. Yes, sir. Does your uh, office of offer any type of um, consulting for you know individuals or groups that are interested in setting up some of these sites? Uh, we do. We do. Um, we do. We we do it in some cases as part of of grants. So you can write in a consulting day, and we're happy to do that. You know, we're a nonprofit too. So bottom basement. Um, but the other thing that we do is we occasionally hold play dates, uh, which means everybody pack a lunch and come on out to GMU for a day and learn how to use the stuff. Um, we haven't done that in a while, but, but we should do that. Um, we have done a bunch of those, and we, we probably should continue to do them. Um, but the other thing is there's all sorts of good screencasts on the site and, and, and lessons learned and case studies in the documentation about how other people have used the material. So. Yes. At the beginning of your presentation, by the way, thank you very much. This is very helpful. And and uh, once you started showing some of the uh, applications, and I said, oh, I, we could use that. <laughs> um, and, 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 and what I'd like to pursue is uh, two points with you. One, based on what you know about uh, the project that we have done so far, um, and of course, there are lots of dimensions to it that you know I didn't have time to talk about. How would you think you could be helpful? <laughs> and then at the beginning, at the top of your presentation,
presentation, you said that the Humanities Council should partner with you and your and the other universities. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you envision that that could play out? Right. Well, so that's absolutely the second. The second question is easier. Um, as I said in answer to the first question, we're happy to be partners on grants, and so that can mean <laughs> anything from the possibility that we build you a website, you know, you just hire us as your technology partner, but also that we do this sort of content consulting and, and methodological consulting, and so we're, we're happy to do that. Um, I haven't looked at your site, but it sounds like a spectacular project, um, and I think that probably once I look at it, I might be able to, I don't know, you seem like you know what you're doing. So, um, but it's a possibility that there's always sort of more functionality you can add. The question is, is it the right functionality for your community? Are you asking the right questions? Are there untapped resources in your community that you can reach out to using these sorts of things? Um, one thing that we're developing that might be of interest to all of you because mobile devices are much more, becoming much more prevalent than laptops and, and those sorts of things is we're in the process of building uh, an iPhone app that will allow you to record oral histories using your mobile phone and directly upload them to your Mecca site. So, yeah. That would have made our project so much easier. It's not done yet. It's not done yet, but we're working on it because we know that's what people want. So, yes sir. Uh, just a, a question. So you're saying the, uh, well, I'm asking the question. Uh, the Zotero, that is a research tool and the uh, Omeka is a uh, presentation tool? Absolutely, okay. and they work together. So anything, if you've got a collection in Zotero, you can import it into your Omeka site. So if you've, if you've collected a bunch of archival items, you can import it into your Omeka site, and anything that is in an Omeka site is Zotero readable. And the uh, downloadable software is free, just like WordPress. You have to yes, it yes, it's free, and it and open source, which means it runs on a LAMP stack, Linux, Apache. Mm -hmm. So most hosting, most hosting companies run on Linux servers. So one more question. Yes, Zotero is free too. The, um, All of the plugins that are available on the hosted version exist already for the downloadable version. They're all free. So, yeah, so they, there's no cost for any of the plugins if you, if you run, run the downloadable version yourself. All right. Happy to talk to other folks, and I have some cards if you can't remember the site names. So. <laughs>